Okay. I see some of you are still um, connecting to audio. Um, but let me just go ahead and welcome everybody to the Foundation for Animal Care and Education's webinar on cancer awareness and screening in pets. My name is Annie Peterson. I'm the Education Manager for the Faith Foundation, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Um, the Faith, for those of you that don't know, the Faith Foundation is a nonprofit organization that helps to prevent economic euthanasia in our community due to financial limitations of pet parents. Although our programs focus mainly on providing emergency veterinary care for pets, for the past few years, FACE has been a grateful recipient of a Petco Cancer Grant and of the Rob Family Grant to use specifically towards helping pets with cancer treatment. So before we get started, I just wanted to note a few things for those of you who may or may not be familiar with Zoom. So all of you will be muted during the course of this presentation to avoid background noise. And the camera feature will also be turned off so we can focus all of our attention on our speaker. Um, you will have an opportunity to ask questions throughout the presentation by typing them using the chat feature. So some of you might have it at the bottom of your screen or at the side, but there is a chat feature where you can type in your questions. Um, questions will be answered toward the end of the presentation. So you can ask them throughout, but they'll be answered toward the end. Um, when typing your question into chat, you will have the option to send to everyone or just me, Annie Peterson, and then we'll get that question. Um, if you would like your question to be anonymous, please use my name only to send your question to, and then I can relay it to Dr. Prue. So I will now introduce Sini uh, Roth, our board president and co-founder. Sini's passion is animals, and she's been a loving pet parent for years and has dealt with the realities of pets with cancer and the treatment process. She's also been a client of Dr. Cruz and is happy to be here with us today. Take it away, Sini. Thank you, Annie. Well, uh, thank you for having me, and thank you for all of our participants for phoning in and uh, or not phoning in, but going on the uh, new wave of the future, Zoom. So to all you little Zoomies, here we go. Um, I am really, really honored to be able to introduce our speaker today, Dr. David Pru. Um, Dr. Pru is the head of radiation oncology and a member of the Angel Care Cancer Center, a California veterinary specialist, CVS. His areas of expertise within oncology include both medical and radiation oncology. Prior to joining CBS, Dr. Pru completed a small animal internship at North Carolina State University. And when he finished, after he finished his medical oncology residency in 2003 and a radiation oncology residency in 2005, also at North Carolina State University, he earned board certification as a specialist in medical oncology and radiation oncology. During this training, Dr. Pru also received a master's degree in specialized veterinary medicine. Oh my goodness, I mean, we are just so blessed to have him. He earned his doctor of veterinary medicine at Tufts University, and he held a bachelor of science from Tufts University, and he lived in Kenya for two years as a Fulbright scholar. Um, I've had personal interactions with Dr. Pru over the past 15 months because our dog Rocco was diagnosed with lymphoma. And I have to tell you, uh, as many of you that are listening in know what a scary thing that is. Uh, with a lot of handholding and a lot of expertise, I can say our Rocco is in remission. And this man is not just a gentleman, but he's a gentleman. And I am honored here to introduce Dr. David Crow. Thank you, Sini, that, for those kind words. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay and uh, bear with me. I never, um, I've never given a lecture via Zoom before, so this is new. And I think we're all uh, being forced into uh, doing new things or do the same things in new ways. And ultimately, that's not a bad thing, but it certainly creates. Uh, 
I, I guess it puts us outside of our comfort zone. So I, I hope what I want to impart to you today will be uh, useful and, and entertaining a, as well. Uh, so um, uh, uh, hopefully I can uh, theoretically uh, can see my screen and maybe just uh, message Annie if there are uh, any issues at all. Sorry, just bear with me as I fix a couple things here. Okay, so I wanted to talk to everyone today about uh, pet cancer awareness and, and screening. Uh, and ultimately, uh, as a group, we need to collectively, sorry, I need to change my screen here real quick, uh, collectively become more vigilant and aware about cancer. Um, sorry. Uh, and there's a natural tendency to avoid things that we fear. And certainly we know with cancer, there's so many negative connotations associated with cancer in society. When I think about cancer, even for myself, I think a lot about pain and suffering and a poor quality of life. And so we can all agree that cancer is a terrible disease. But when it comes to our pets, we potentially do a disservice to our pets by ignoring cancer. And uh, as I've gotten older, maybe when I was younger, I, I used to just try to avoid problems. But the reality is we have to try to tackle things head on. So burying our heads in the sand is really not the way we should be dealing with cancer. But instead, we need to collectively become much more aware and vigilant about cancer because there's actually a benefit to both us and our patients if we can acquire some basic knowledge about cancer well before the time uh, potentially one of our own pets gets diagnosed. And if we can do this, we actually have the ability to empower ourselves to make appropriate decisions if our pets are in the unfortunate circumstance where they're diagnosed with cancer. Uh, we can also potentially do some things to maybe work proactively to try to reduce the risk of cancer. And it's important, I really want to impart as well, is that understanding that early detection is probably the single most important thing that we can do to enhance survival in pets diagnosed with cancer. The earlier you detect, and this is true in people, the earlier you diagnose and detect a cancer, uh, ultimately the better the outcome. And so if we talk about the outline today, I'm going to talk about a number of different things. Uh, the first of which is just giving you some general statistics about the incidence of cancer, uh, potential causes, what causes cancer, uh, and that leads us into a natural discussion, are there ways that we can prevent cancer? And that's going to be the bulk of the talk, but we are going to talk also a little bit about diagnosis and staging and treatments. Uh, just so you can at least develop a little bit of the vernacular involved uh, with cancer and pets. And at the very end, I'm going to touch a little bit on supplemental therapies because that's something that comes up on a daily basis when I talk to clients. So if we talk about the incidence of cancer, uh, we know there are roughly about 170 million pets in the U.S., uh, and the staggering number is that 4 million dogs and four, roughly 4 million cats are diagnosed with cancer each year, uh, which are just huge, huge numbers. Uh, and we know that 50% of dogs that are older than 10 will develop uh, cancer. And so in dogs that are over 10, cancer far and away is the leading cause of death. And the scary thing is actually 25% of dogs of, of any age will actually develop cancer. And, and for me, what's really scary is, is that those numbers are actually higher than in people. Yet in people, we know people engage in a lot of different negative behaviors, uh, poor diet, uh, smoking, and other things that increase the risk of cancer. But by and large, animals are not really being exposed to these lifestyle choices. Yet despite that fact, such a high number of animals uh, develop cancer. Um, we potentially actually have lower numbers in cats. There, there are fewer studies and cats have oftentimes been kind of second class citizens when people do research on, on cancer. Uh, we don't really know for sure, but at least based upon what I see, I think in the end, uh, the incidence of cancer in cats in general is, is lower, particularly cats under 10, we, we're less likely to see it. So 
what we don't really know is, is that over the years, there are no real studies that have really determined whether or not the incidence of cancer is changing over the past two decades. Um, and the end is, uh, I know when I talk to clients, you know, and, and we all agree, you know, we didn't really talk or hear much about cancer 30 years ago in pets. And the question is, was it there? We just didn't know about it. Um, and the question now comes is, is the incidence now increasing as it is in people? From my perspective, though, it really does appear as though the numbers are increasing. When I look in my own practice, <clears throat> the number of cases that I, that I see on an annual basis, the number of doctors I have with me treating cancer patients continue to increase. And it's hard for me to know right now, is that a true increase? Perhaps uh, pet owners themselves are becoming more aware of cancer, so it's uh, more people coming to see us. And then primary care veterinarians are also becoming more aware and detecting. But nonetheless, the number of cases that are diagnosed and being treated or presented for potential treatments for cancer seem to be increasing. And so it raises this question in saying, well, why is this happening? Why are we seeing more cancer now? Um, and there's a natural tendency, and we all do this. You know, I have clients that come in and, and you know, say that, you know, that their neighbor has been, you know, using Roundup for years, and it's, you know, because of the Roundup that, you know, cancer, their dog got cancer. Um, and there is this natural tendency to kind of blame it on a single event or a single, a single thing, or oftentimes, you know, a patient might have a medical procedure, a dental procedure, and a couple months later they develop cancer, and people might try to create a link. The, the truth is, is it's rarely that simple. And the reality is in most cases, as in human medicine, the development of cancer likely is multifactorial. And for me, the major factors that really play into this uh, that have uh, worth a conversation in animals are age, genetics, and then environmental factors. So I'd like to take a little bit of time and go over each one of these uh, individually. So age is certainly a, a major factor. I mean, it's, there's no doubt about it as animals get older, um, the, the risk of getting cancer increases. And, and if we think about cancer, Cancer arises when one of the normal cells in the body undergoes a mutation. So we have a normal cell, it undergoes a mutation, and it becomes abnormal. These abnormal cells will divide uncontrollably. And at some point, if they divide uncontrollably, they have the potential to overtake their, their host. Um, well, what we know is, is that the longer that you live, there's a greater likelihood that something can actually go wrong. And so this is why we see in people, as well as animals, as people get older, uh, cancer increases. So this might be one of the reasons why we see more cancer, because we all know is that the care that my clients provide, the care that veterinarians are able to provide, uh, have significantly improved over the last two decades. And now we're seeing animals live longer and longer. Well, one of the consequences of that then is that we can actually see, because of this increased longevity, an increased risk of patients developing cancer. We also know that there's clearly, and probably even more so in animals than there are in people, is there's a huge influence of genetics in the development of cancer. And probably uh, in people, we do know that there's some genetic predispositions. Certainly people who carry certain uh, given genes might be at an increased risk for developing, uh, let's say breast cancer or other types of cancers as well. And the same is likely true in pets. Um, but the way we think about genetics and pets and the influence of genetics is that we know that given breeds of dogs, certain breeds seem to have different predispositions. Or I can take any particular type of cancer, name a cancer, and I can probably list for you one or two breeds of dogs, maybe less so cats, 
that seem to have a predisposition. Well, the only reason why there's a predisposition is there's something unique about that breed, and it's the genetic makeup of that breed that makes them that breed of animal. There's something about their genetic makeup that is predisposing them. And so clearly there's a huge influence of genetics when it comes to animals and cancer. Now that's not to say that every dog that gets cancer there's something wrong with their genetic makeup. But certainly, if you have a given breed of a dog that they get one of the characteristic types of cancers of that breed, there's probably at least a genetic component. And so there's certainly an implication uh, that genes are uh, influencing uh, a predisposition for, you know, for certain types of cancer. So if we talk about some of the genetics, it's worthwhile talking a little bit just about some of these uh, breed predispositions. And this is by no means uh, an exhaustive list in any shape or form, uh, but I definitely wanna at least highlight some of the things that are, are most important. And uh, for certain, you know, Bernie's Mountain Dogs, which are, you know, beautiful and wonderful dogs, uh, probably somewhere in the ballpark of 40 to 50% of dogs of this breed will develop some type of cancer in their lifespan. And then the, the golden retriever who, you know, also just amazing dogs. Um, but there's some studies that clearly show that roughly 60% of dogs, golden retrievers will develop some type of cancer. And so clearly there's a genetic component here. There's something and probably more than one thing about their genetic makeup that is predisposing them to develop cancer. Um, boxers as well, just to name a few, they seem to be a little bit more predisposed to brain tumors as well as mast cell tumors and lymphomas. And then Scottish Terriers, they have a strong, uh, a strong predilection to developing tumors in, in their bladder. Uh, cats, again, cats kind of get the short end of the stick when it comes to people doing studies. Uh, there certainly are not as many uh, studies out there to look at cats, and, and I don't think there are as many strong associations, mostly because when it comes to cats, the majority of cats out there um, are usually of mixed breeding, so there are not not as many purebred cats. Um, these are, are things in my own experience, Bengal cats, uh, are seem to be predisposed to develop different types of lymphomas and other blood origin cancers. And then Siamese, uh, there's a number of different cancers, salivary gland, uh, mast cell tumors, and others that Siamese uh, cats also seem to be predisposed to. And then this is the thing which I think for me has really been maybe a little bit more uh, concerning for, for me, I guess, personally, when I think about my own life and, and what I've seen now as an oncologist, uh, you know, over the, over the past, um, the, the past 20 years is I really believe that environmental factors are likely a major component in the development of cancer in pets. Um, and really, this is what scares me the most because I think about it, and again, you know, we talk about people who are, you know, overindulging in, in things that they shouldn't, you know, either high fat diets or smoking and, and other lifestyle choices. And, you know, a person who chews tobacco and develops a cancer in their mouth, you, you know, it's disappointing, but we, we kind of know, know why that happened. And, or, you know, we know that when people smoke and they themselves know that they might be at an increased risk for developing lung cancer. What really scares me the most is we're seeing epidemic levels of cancer in, in pets, yet they're not engaged in those activities. And so, so there must be things in the environment. Let's move beyond older dogs getting cancer. Let's move beyond, you know, some of the, you know, golden retrievers getting cancer. There are plenty of animals that I see on a daily basis that don't fit the mold of a, an older golden retriever getting cancer. And there's gotta be reasons as to why they're developing cancer. And so for me, this is really what scares me the most because I honestly think there's so many things out there in our environment that we're all exposed to, not just our pets, 
that are probably damaging our bodies in a way that are predisposing us to cancer. Now, the tough thing is there really are not that many studies uh, in pets that look at the exposure to a given chemical, uh, and that is a conse you know, consequently going to cause a, a given type of cancer. Um, those studies are just really not there when it comes to pets. And the truth is, it's never going to be that simple. There's no one cancer uh, or chemical that's going to cause a given cancer. Instead, it's probably going to be exposure to multiple chemicals over many years that will predis predispose a patient. And so let's first talk about some of the things that we know. And, and some of the things we know are, are obvious. And, and the only reason why I bring these up is because I think we can extrapolate this and potentially extend it into things that we don't yet know, um, but I think we can make some reasonable assumptions. And so one thing that we can do is we can talk about environmental tobacco smoke. Well, we all know there's certainly a multitude of car carcinogens in tobacco smoke. We know people who uh, you know, struggle with the addiction to uh, nicotine and uh, intake in tobacco or at increased risk of developing some type of cancer. Well, that's also been shown in, in, in pets as well. We know that cats that live in a household where a person smokes, they're at an increased risk of developing uh, a tumor in their mouth, oral squamous cell carcinoma. And what the thought is, is these cats are sitting in their household, the secondhand environmental tobacco smoke gets on their fur. And what we know is cats, uh, you know, don't take baths and we don't bathe them, but they certainly take care of themselves by licking. And if they lick and lick and lick, what's happening is the underside of their tongue is being exposed to large quantities of chemicals, carcinogens over time, and then cats will develop these tumors on the, under this tongue. So this has been proven. And it's, so it's a, a clear example that something in the outside environment, uh, a toxin, a mutagen or carcinogen can cause cancer in a pet. We also know in a similar scenario that dogs that live in uh, households where they're exposed to environmental tobacco smoke, they're less likely to get lung cancer, but we certainly see them getting nasal tumors at a higher frequency. And if we think about the dog nose, the dog nose being much longer than in, in a person uh, is more of a filter. And so the, the nose will basically filter out those carcinogens uh, and long-term exposure to carcinogens can increase the risk of developing nasal tumors. There are also some studies that have looked at animals that live uh, in more industrial areas um, seem to be at an increased risk of developing lymphoma. And no doubt about it, in human medicine, we know that exposure to a whole variety of chemicals uh, can increase the risk of, of people developing lymphoma. The most classic example is you know, exposure to Roundup uh, very clearly has been associated with the development of lymphoma in people. Uh, and then there are also some studies that have shown, maybe not quite as conclusively, but dogs who are exposed to pesticides and herbicides seem to be at an increased risk of developing uh, bladder cancer. So you ingest these chemicals. These chemicals are eliminated by the kidneys. They end up in the bladder. Well, we know that a lot of dogs, particularly uh, female dogs, will hold their urine for extended periods of time. The direct contact of these carcinogens in the bladder in contact with the wall of the bladder can increase the risk of a, of a person developing, uh, a pet developing cancer. So that's the knowledge. This is what we know. What do I suspect? And, and, and I'll make it very clear. Um, I'm talking more from personal experience I, I might be on my soapbox and, and so there's less data here, but um, I can certainly say in the last 20 years, I've seen trends that for me are, are really alarming. And again, I think, I think I can't just explain cancer based upon uh, age of an animal, a breed of a dog, especially when I know that my pet owners are taking incredible care of their pets, feeding the right foods, yet these animals are getting, can't, still getting cancer. There's gotta be a reason to it. And my suspicion, uh, and this is a conversation I have pretty much every day with my clients, because I'm asked this question, 
uh, pretty much on a daily or weekly basis is why did my dog get cancer in the first place? And my feeling is, is that we are all exposed to thousands of chemicals in our environment every single day. Um, you know, nothing in our world is real anymore. Everything is made out of plastics. Wood is not even real wood anymore. And so we're exposed to thousands of uh, chemicals each day. We also have evidence, to, and there was a recent study that said that if you drink uh, you know, bottled water <clears throat> in any significant quantity, you're ingesting thousands of microplastic particles each year. Uh, we also know that pesticides and herbicides and other, other chemicals are pervasive uh, in our environment. And my belief is, what I suspect, is that it's not exposure to one chemical or, or one agent, but rather exposure to a multiple chemicals throughout a lifetime increases the risk of cancer in pets. Um, and it's likely that the impact of this exposure, you know, what I'm exposed to versus my dog, it's probably roughly the same, but there's some differences. And it's probably this impact is more significant on pets than in people. And we say, well, why is that? Well, one of the big reasons is we know that, you know, we're gonna brush our teeth every day, multiple times a day. We're gonna wash our hands multiple times a day. People bathe daily and, and people wash their clothes. So all these things that we are in contact with every day, we're constantly washing them off our body. But that doesn't happen in pets. You know, most people, me included, uh, don't necessarily brush their dog's teeth every day. Uh, you know, animals, you can't bathe them every single day. That's actually not good for their, for their skin or their, or their hair coat. And so animals are, are coming in contact with these chemicals and they stay on their body and they're probably ingesting these chemicals and in ingesting these chemicals uh, at some point, not in all patients, but in some pets, it might ultimately lead to the development of, of cancer. And so what I've seen personally, and this is something that has actually changed over the last 20 years, is I had some patients where if I think about certain diseases, there are certain diseases that I see the same number now as I did 20 years ago. And so I say, you know, there's probably not an environmental factor, but there are other cancers that I see far more now than I did 20 years ago. And, and the ones that I've seen, particularly are tumors that occur in the mouth of dogs. Um, the number of dogs I now see with oral tumors has increased dramatically. And for me, that can only tell me it has something to do with either oral hygiene uh, or more likely, again, the, the mouth is probably one of the areas of greatest exposure to, to things in our environment. Um, I've seen an increase in the number of cats who were diagnosed with squamous cell carcinoma on the tongue. But I, mind you, I mentioned that dogs or cats that live in a smoking household get this disease. But now I'm seeing plenty of cats that are getting this disease and, and they don't live in smoking households. So clearly they're being exposed to something else. Uh, and then I'm also seeing an increased number of dogs uh, diagnosed with tumors in the nasal cavity. Nasal cavity tumors are really um, uh, uh, are really a, a, a major a major factor, um, and so sorry, hold on a second here. Um, and so uh, we see so many dogs that develop uh, nasal cavity tumors, and I see that far more here in Southern California than I saw on the East Coast. And it tells us there are probably things in our environment. The other thing which really scares me a lot is in the last two decades, I've also observed that I, I see in my mind, and I say this with a little bit of caution, but what I believe are potential clustering of certain types of cancers uh, in certain areas. And I can give you an example. Um, I won't say the area, although it's not in San Diego, uh, where um, if I see a dog from this, you know, one area of about 20 square miles, the vast majority of dogs I'm seeing seem to have bladder cancers far more than anywhere else. Or if I see a dog, you know, with bladder cancer, I, I, I can almost predict where they came from. And so it tells us there's got to be something in the environment. There are some neighborhoods where I certainly have seen and I've treated 
you know, four or five people's dogs and families' dogs for lymphoma, uh, you know, maybe that's just a fluke, uh, but maybe there's something, you know, in that environment. And so, so that scares me. And again, nasal tumors, uh, for sure, we definitely see, uh, you know, certain areas, uh, particularly in areas that have been more likely uh, suffering from wildfires, uh, we tend to see uh, more dogs developing nasal tumors, at least that's our impression. Um, so with all these terrible things, there's one thing I want to say, uh, which is to say, I'm not saying that anyone is doing something wrong. I'm not saying that people are being negligent. Uh, and what my dog is exposed to in my household is no different than <clears throat> what anyone else's dog is. But I think as a, as, a, as a society, we've not been as conscious as we need to about, about what's in our environment, what our things are made of, what sort of containers do we drink from, and, and so I, I just say these things to help to try to raise awareness. And so then it leads to this next question of saying, how do we actually prevent cancer? Um, and this is one of the hardest things because information about cancer prevention, particularly in animals, is pretty much lacking. Um, you know, in people you can prevent by stopping smoking and eat better, get more healthy. And, and um, but in animals, you know, what did I tell you? I said, well, the major causes of cancer are increased age. There's not a lot we were going to do about that. Uh, breeds are more like certain breeds. Well, we're not we're, we're not going to stop owning breeds that are predisposed to a cancer. I mean, people love golden retrievers, and and so uh, I don't think people are going to stop, you know, having golden retrievers, and and so that's not practical. So um, now there are a couple things we probably could do. Um, one thing would be, you know, on the breeding side of it, if there's certain lines uh, of dogs that have an increased risk of cancer, uh, it may be worthwhile for breeders to, you know kind of alter their breeding practices to, you know, to maybe use alternate lines, perhaps ones that are less, less, uh, less likely to carry genes that, that can cause cancer uh, or predisposed to cancer. Um, this is a hard thing to do, but we certainly can consider the possibility of trying to reduce exposure to chemicals. Uh, so, you know, the things that I I'm really cautious, and I'm sure most people are now, about things that I put in my yard, what gets sprayed around there. Uh, for all of our safety, um, trying to avoid plastics as much as possible. Um, I don't really want to get into a discussion about spay and neuter, except to say that there's some conflicting information about spay and, and neuter. Uh, and the biggest issue about spay and neuter is, you know, do you early, do you spay early or late? Uh, with this conflicting information, and I'll tell you why, is that studies have shown that if you spay a dog at a young age, um, you know, before the first or second heat, they're much less likely to develop mammary cancer. Or to put it another way, a dog who's gone through at least two heat cycles is 28 times more likely to develop tumor, mammary tumors later in life. So clearly there's an advantage to, to uh, spaying and neutering at a younger age. The problem is, there's also some breeds that if you spay or neuter them earlier in life, they actually might be at an increased risk of bone cancer. So in some way, we're kind of damned if we do, damned if we don't. Uh, and I guess I'd say is the information we have is relatively preliminary. So uh, I think more studies need to be done in this regard. So if we move to the next phase and talking about diagnosis, um, with rare exception, and a lot of times we'll say, well, can we just do a blood test? Well, in veterinary medicine, blood work in most cancers, with the exception of leukemias, really can't be used to diagnose cancer at all. Um, in fact, I see plenty of animals on a daily basis with cancer, and some of them very severe cancers, yet their blood work is completely normal. Um, and so we rarely can diagnose cancer uh, based on blood work. Another thing to point out is that the look or feel of a tumor, it may affect our suspicions, um, but we can't diagnose a tumor this way. And so I always encourage clients if they go to their primary vet or they themselves say, oh, it, you know, feels soft, it feels squishy, it's, it's movable. Um, you know, I, I think it's just a fatty growth. Well, it may be, and hopefully it is, 
But the truth of the matter is, unless you poke a needle in it or obtain a sample from it, there's no way to know for sure. Uh, and so the look or feel of a tumor might alter our suspicions, but we can't diagnose this way. And so ultimately, getting a, a sample is the only way to diagnose. Now, diagnosis in animals, there's some easy ways to do it. And we can certainly do a, a needle aspirate where you literally just poke a very small needle into a mass. Uh, you can get a few cells. It takes a couple minutes. It's not always going to get an answer, but for a test that requires no sedation in a couple minutes, for many tumors, especially things like lipomas, we can figure it out very quickly. Um, biopsy usually entails actually going in with a larger instrument, taking a piece of a tumor or removing all together. Um, um, the benefit is, is you can actually tell based on a biopsy if a mass is benign or malignant. Uh, we can tell if it needs to be addressed or if so, how do we need to address it? And I do wanna bring up the point, and I hear this a lot, um, you know, and it's out there in, in the world, is, is this a concern that, uh, that if we take a sample, if you biopsy a tumor or you poke a needle into it, you're gonna make the tumor more angry or it might increase the spread of cancer. And, and I guess what I would say is there's, there's always that possibility, but the advantages of figuring out what the, your pet has and figuring out what it is, is far, far greater than the small, small risk of cancer spreading. By and large, I think, yes, we can all hear about those examples that a patient had a biopsy and their tumor grew much more significantly afterwards. Those things can happen, but I would say that's certainly not the norm. On the alternative, if we don't figure out what a cancer is and we just leave it because we're afraid to biopsy it, we're actually potentially causing more, more harm where we could have actually helped. Uh, and then the final thing is I, I, I have a lot of people that come to me and they were told um, by, by their vet perhaps or, or technician friend or other things to say, you know, let's just look at a mass and let's just keep an eye on it and see if it grows. Well, I can tell you the vast majority of masses, be it benign or malignant, they will grow. Um, and so it shouldn't be surprising to us it's gonna grow. So we should never just keep an eye on it. Now it is okay for us to say, we're gonna watch this for a period of time because certainly a little swelling that's a bug bite and it goes away, we don't wanna to have to have done a biopsy on it. But if a mass is persistent for a couple months and it's getting bigger, um, then, then we probably should try to figure out. And again, hopefully it's something benign. 85% of the time when dogs get a mass on the skin, it's going to be benign, um, but we shouldn't necessarily make those assumptions. Um, but once we've actually obtained a diagnosis of some type of malignant cancer, there's some other things that we need to know. And, and really what we need to know is how aggressive is it? Is it invasive into the surrounding tissues? And has it spread somewhere else? And in the end, the answer of these questions, which we obtain mostly by a biopsy um, and other testing that we'll talk about, will help us to determine what our treatment options are and, and, and more importantly, what is an actual prognosis for a given patient. And so if we go through these, uh, talking about what are the staging tests, and, and there's gonna be some nuances for different types of tumors and different types of cancers, but these kind of just give you a general overview. Um, of things that should be done if a patient has that diagnosis of cancer. And the first thing is to say, we should be running blood work. Now, as I just mentioned, Blood work tells us really nothing about cancer itself, but what is important is blood work will tell us about the overall health status of a patient. And so it can tell us that if we're considering other things like surgery or other treatments, it allows us to determine if they're actually a good candidate. Uh, and it allows us to identify if these are pets that have other concurrent diseases that might influence our potential for success or failure. Um, the next place are chest x-rays. Chest x-rays are incredibly common, and the reason why we take chest x-rays in patients that have cancer is because can the lungs are far and away the most common location for cancers to spread. So with a very simple test, we can take x-rays of the lungs and ensure that a cancer hasn't spread. Uh, ultrasounds are used uh, where we basically look at the abdomen 
in the end, the x-rays are not very good for looking at the liver, the kidneys, and the spleen, but an ultrasound is incredibly good at looking at these organs to help identify potential spread and make sure that, again, a patient is healthy. And then far and away, one of the things that's becoming a lot more common these days are CT scan, um, which are basically three-dimensional x-rays that allow us to see in much greater detail the inside parts of the body. And it allows us to get a full idea of where a tumor is, how extensive it is, and, and ensuring that it hasn't spread. And then real briefly, again, I don't really want this to be a talk about cancer treatment, uh, but just wanna go over a couple things. Uh, for the most uh, clients, when it comes to treatment, the discussion of cancer treatment, and this is probably what discourages people from even talking about cancer is the fact that when we talk about cancer treatment for most of us, it conjures up images of pain and suffering and a poor quality of life. And what I encourage my clients to do is throw what you know about cancer therapy out the window when it comes to pets, because the parallels between people and pets with cancer will only go so far. And an important point that I always highlight is to say as oncologists, veterinary oncologists, we cannot and will not be anywhere near as aggressive with our treatments as our human counterparts. Instead, when we talk to our clients about potential treatments, we're gonna have a really thorough discussion of evaluation of the pros and cons of treatment. And this doesn't happen in human medicine. In human medicine, they're basically saying, here's what you need to do. But in the veterinary setting, we're gonna talk about a lot of different things, including a patient's age, what sort of life stage they're at, their overall health status, what other illnesses do they have, certainly the goals of a family, uh, the pet family as a whole, what people's expectations are, quality of life is always going to be front and center uh, of any discussion. And, and then we're also talk about finances as well, because that's certainly uh, in, in our veterinary world, uh, most people don't carry insurance. And so we have to make decisions somewhat on, on financial situations. And so the job of an oncologist, at least in my mind, what a good oncologist is, is not to come into a room or on a phone call and convince people to do treatment. Rather, it's to educate. Education is really the way we can empower people to theoretically make, make decisions. And so we talk about treatments real quickly. Again, this is mostly to give you the vernacular is I can, you know, we talk about chemotherapy, which is one of the ways that we treat pets with cancer. Basically, it's the administration of medications into the body to fight cancer. Most of these medications are given intravenously or orally. Um, as you would imagine, though, we're only going to use chemotherapy for tumors that have spread somewhere else or they're systemic. Uh, if a patient has a tumor in just one location, then uh, giving chemotherapy to the whole body doesn't make sense. Chemotherapy itself does not hurt. Uh, we tend to use lower dosages than are used in people. Um, the most common side effect we see in pets is nausea and vomiting. But I would also highlight to say that it's only seen in about 15% of the cases we treat. So the majority of patients that we treat can actually receive chemotherapy and not experience significant side effects. Radiation therapy, which is really kind of more in my wheelhouse, is basically the administration of x-rays. We take a, a very high powered radiation machine, we deliver radiation to just one part of the body. And so the rest of the body is not exposed, so patients don't experience nausea or vomiting or systemic illness. Um, now there is a big difference when it comes to radiation in, in people versus animals. In people, when they use radiation, they're gonna give really high doses all the time because they're trying to obliterate a cancer. Yes, we do that in some circumstances, but one thing that we do that they do less frequently in people is we say, let's not give that high dose of radiation. Let's give a lower dose of radiation. And our goal is not to obliterate that cancer, but let's just try to shrink it down. If we can shrink a tumor down and reduce the pressure of a tumor, we can potentially give a patient a better quality of life. And, and this here, basically highlights what we can do with radiation. And this is a CT scan of a dog um, that basically has a tumor in the nasal passage. Here's the right eye, here's the left eye. This is the nasal passage right here that I'm showing you. And normally this area should be black, 
and in black indicates that it's an air-filled space and you should have air in your nasal passage. Instead, it's being occluded by this tumor and this poor dog couldn't breathe through her nose because, because this tumor was blocking it. Well, we did radiation and again, just low dose radiation and literally three months later, you can see the vast majority of the tumor had regressed. And again, this was not high dose radiation, but with a handful of doses, we significantly reduced the nasal congestion and, and gave this patient a, a better quality of life. And so this is one of the major ways that we use radiation in pets. And then the final thing I want to talk about real quickly, and, and there may be questions about this, is when it, I get questions every single day about supplements and supplemental therapies and anything from CBD to turmeric to turkey tail mushroom and products that are being sold online, uh, canine immunity and, and so many others, dozens. Um, and what I would say is the truth is, is that there's actually no data out there to say that any of these things are proven. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm against their use. Uh, doesn't mean I think there's not some potential benefits there, um, but I'm still inherently skeptical. And one of the reasons why I'm skeptical is there are people, particularly online, that are looking to make money. Uh, and so they capitalize on my clients' fears and, and hopes and, and try to get people to buy their products and, and you know, even make them feel bad or feel like they're remiss if they don't buy their products. Um, I, I think in the end, I think most of the products out there are probably safe. Uh, there may actually be some benefits to some things, particularly turkey tail mushroom and certain diseases. CB, CBD is certainly intriguing, but right now we just don't know. And so we need to do a lot more studies. And so I would encourage people to just kind of look at <clears throat> anything out there with a little bit of a, a, a jaded or skeptical eye. Um, and so finally, if I were to summarize, um, you know, what we really are seeing is that cancer has reached epidemic proportions, but what we can, by arming ourselves with information, combat this disease. And some of the ways we can do it is reduce exposures to chemicals. If we notice a problem in our pets, is not ignore them and, and try to focus on getting early detection. Uh, there's also plenty of very modern therapies available that are far less toxic than what we traditionally think about with cancer therapy. Uh, but it's really important to recognize if we ever consider treating pets, we're always gonna be focused on quality of life because in the end of the day, putting an animal through the ringer, you know, to just get a few extra months is not what this is about. Rather, it's uh, continuing to focus on quality of life, improving quality of life, uh, but frankly, not being too aggressive. So I really thank for your, for your time and I, I, I hope that was in some form useful and I'm certainly happy to, uh, to uh, take some questions. Okay, sorry, Dr. Pru, I had to unmute myself. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so uh, we do have a couple of questions for you. So the first one, um, this person would like you to discuss skin lesions, which what are suspicious and require immediate attention and what changes should um, pet owners look for? Yeah, and you know, so skin lesions are one of the most common things that people will notice just because they're, they're right there and, and you, know, you can see them. Um, so I would remind people and saying, you know, ultimately 85% of skin masses are going to be benign. Um, and the hard thing is, is, you know, a dog, you know, there are plenty of times I've seen patients come in, they have a mass and clients are concerned and, you know, and it turns out it was just a, a bug bite. And so the approach I would take is, is first thing to do, if you notice something and it's less than the size of an eraser head, then, and you just notice it, I would really kind of make note of where it is because a lot of times people have a hard time finding masses again. Um, so make note of it or put a mark with a Sharpie uh, or something of that nature and then look at it again a week or two later. And, and a lot of little, again, bites or irritations will, will regress on their own. Um, but if it's still there um, and it persists for more than a couple weeks, I would recommend, you know, it's simple to, to have a veterinarian poke a little needle into it and look under the microscope and see if it's anything. 
um, it's hard to really say uh, a given appearance. And the reason why is example of mast cell tumors, which are one of the more common tumors we see, they can look like anything. Um, they can look like plaques, they can look like growth, they can feel like lipomas and, and everything in between. Um, now, ultimately to state the obvious, if there was a mass that was really bloody and growing by the day, you know, whether it's an infection or a mass, you know, probably needs to be evaluated. But uh, we don't need to panic every time we see something, because again, we're gonna see plenty of things on the skin. Uh, if something is relatively slow growing, it's not like we have to emergently have a patient, you know, come in and see their vet. But there are things that are worth noting and should write them down so the next time you go to your vet, it's worth saying, oh, I've noticed this and I didn't notice it before. Can you check it out? Now, what, what we shouldn't accept as an answer is someone to say, oh, I think it's, I think it's nothing. Um, I'm not sure what it is. I think it's nothing. Let's just keep a watch on it. Now, in most cases, I, that sometimes can lead us to problems. Now, there are a few exceptions, like some dogs might get like a papilloma on the skin and it's so clear that it's a wart or a skin tag. Yeah, we don't need to work those ones up, but, um, but we shouldn't necessarily just accept an answer to say, let's just watch it. And I hear that a lot. Um, so I would, uh, I would encourage people to be very proactive about, about uh, questioning that recommendation. Okay, um, so we do have time for a couple more questions. So uh, would you talk about habangiosarcoma, um, the signs, symptoms, and prognosis? Yeah, so there are different types of hemangiosarcoma. Um, so really, kind of, we can kind of put it into two major categories, uh, those that occur on the inside of the body. So uh, the spleen or around the heart, uh, those are two mouse cell, I mean, uh, hemangiosarcomas that we see. The most common symptom we see with that is basically a mass that ruptures and bleeds and so you have a dog who goes from being perfectly fine to very lethargic and their, their gums are probably pale and uh, because they're bleeding acutely. And so most of those dogs probably had no signs or, or symptoms beforehand. And so it, it, you know, to much dismay, I can't really say there's a lot one can do to, to diagnose those things in advance uh, in most cases. Um, now, hemangiosarcoma also occurs on the skin uh, in certain breeds of dogs like colored pit bulls who like to lay in the sun. They get it as a consequence of sun exposure. Um, you know, those ones are a bit different, not nowhere near as aggressive, and you can kind of see them developing. And um, so, um, but the prognosis for dogs with hemangiosarcoma, particularly in the, in the heart or in the spleen, unfortunately, is pretty poor. Um, you know, the vast majority of dogs that we treat, even if we treat them, uh, honestly, are going to succumb in less than a year, even with the most aggressive types of treatment. Um, there are exceptions to that, um, and certainly it depends on the grade of the tumor and when they were diagnosed. I had a do you know, dog recently that was, we did an ultrasound for some other reason. We found a hemangiosarcoma. It was very early detection. We were lucky, and we removed the spleen, and you know, that's a dog I think that could probably live long term, but most of the ones where we diagnose them, there's, uh, frankly, it's, it's too late to do a lot of help in a lot of patients. Um, okay, thanks, Dr. Pru. Um, so what, uh, what are your thoughts about the quality of pet food and treats as potential harmful and, and causes of cancer? You did speak a little bit about uh, different types of foods or, or supplements. Yeah. Um, this, this person writes in that they saw a documentary a few years back entitled Pet Fooled which highlights the poor quality of pet food and ingredients. Yeah, I mean, I'll start off by saying that, you know, food and nutrition is not my area of expertise. Um, you know, that being said, I, I think the pet in food industry is, is really probably uh, in a difficult position because um, is, you know, 
feeding pets with the, the, the high quality, you know, food and ingredients um, uh, that they probably should be getting is, is difficult to mass produce uh, and it's difficult to package it in a, in, a, in a form that the majority of the people who own pets can, can afford. Um, and so uh, I think in the end, they have to potentially use inferior ingredients um, uh, to, to make commercially available foods that the majority of the public is actually going to buy. Um, and so I, I would, I, you know, I, I'm still more focused personally on more chemical exposures and things. I think that's a lot worse, but I would absolutely say in the end, you know, we know what we put in our bodies, you know, has a huge influence on, on our health um, that I, I think, you know, inherently mass produced uh, foods are not necessarily probably the best thing in the world. When I think about it, I at least try to um, focus on, you know, brands and diets that are all their ingredients are, are not necessarily sourced in countries where they don't have the same standards uh, that we have. Uh, that's one thing. Um, there are plenty of clients who have taken to making their own food. And, and certainly if people have the time and, and the resource to do it, I think that could be good. But, um, you know, I, I, without a doubt, I, you know, I think, you know, we're probably going to, we have seen this even in the last 10 years, the uh, people are becoming a lot more conscious about, you know, what they're feeding their dogs. And I think that's a good thing. Okay, great. Um, now, Dr. Pru, I do want to be um, courteous of your time. Do you have a few minutes yeah. for a couple more questions, or I can just yeah. uh, connect you with people privately? No, I think, uh, um, I think, yeah, I think we can, for another five minutes, I have. Okay, okay. Um, so we do have a question about pet insurance. Um, is it valuable when it comes to cost of treatment? related to cancer and diagnosis? And if so, are there some better than others? Absolutely. Um, without a doubt, um, it's made a huge difference. I have seen so many clients who uh, come to me and, you know, when, we, when we're allowed and able to eliminate finances from a discussion, uh, which is an incredibly difficult thing and conversation I have to have multiple times a day. When I have a patient that has a disease that can be treated and ultimately perhaps even a, a good prognosis, yet the treatment is beyond their means to pursue it, um, I mean, that's just devastating. And so there are some, plenty of insurances out there and I, I don't completely, I don't completely keep up with that. Um, but I am, uh, basically the ones that I would think about, um, uh, I, the ones I would think about would be, um, True Panion. Um, and this is in no means an endorsement, or if I don't mention a, a company, a non-endorsement, but uh, True Panion, Healthy Paws, uh, and Pets Best uh, are the ones that, at least in the cancer realm, that I have seen as being particularly good um, in, in, in covering treatments and oftentimes up to 90%, uh, even pre-approving treatments so so clients don't have to necessarily pay and then deal with reimbursement. So uh, I, I highly encourage now, in the end, I know, you know, in, it, what we know is that on a daily basis uh, or monthly basis, you know, some of these insurance plans are pretty expensive. Um, and, you know, and, and it's always this question about about you know is insurance really worth it or not it, it, it kind of really depends and if any of us have the self-discipline to set aside that amount of money that they would spend on insurance every single month and put it aside and not touch it that's probably even the ideal world because you may never need it um but at least you know insurance offers one the peace of mind uh to know that it, it, you know their pets could get treated or at least if we're going to make decisions it's based on quality of life and prognosis and not based on cost Okay, so um, we've gotten some really great questions and I will um, definitely forward some of them to you, Dr. Pru. Maybe we can um, send out an email answering some of these. Um, I do wanna ask you, so this will be the last question. Um, a question came in regarding a pet 
that has already gone through five days of radiation for nasal cancer and is now showing some symptoms um, previous uh, to the treatment? And if, is it safe to go through another round of radiation um, if this pet is not showing signs of poor quality of life? Hmm. Yeah, and so it really depends. And so if we treat patients and if they had a low dose radiation and the goal was to try to slow the progression of the disease uh, in the hopes of improving or preserving quality of life, then, then we have the potential to do that radiation again in the future. Now, a lot of it will depend on a couple things. One would be, do we think the first time was was, did it work? Was it beneficial? And I'll give you an example. If I treat a dog with a nasal tumor and I treat them, they have a great response. And a year later, that client comes back to me and says, gosh, you know, they might be having some symptoms again. I can look back and say, that's amazing that they did well for a year. And it makes sense to say we could treat them again. If I have a patient where uh, they got treated for a nasal tumor. Unfortunately, not all dogs will respond. And, you know, their congestion improved for a month or two, and then they're congested again, where we look back and say, gosh, they, it was really kind of marginally effective. We could do the radiation again, but I, I don't really encourage it because I, I just don't know how beneficial it's going to be. Now, the other question would be, do you potentially treat a patient before they have symptoms? And, and there's still debate about that, but in the end, my feeling is to say, if we wait for a dog's symptoms to get worse, um, I would rather treat cancer earlier rather than later. So I have a tendency to try to be a little bit more proactive before they have symptoms, because then we're asking less of the radiation. Now, that being said, uh, I don't know if there's a patient I've treated or, or not, and I'm, uh, you know, happy to always, you know, talk about the individual nuances of, of, a, of a given case. Okay. Um, so I, I just want to thank you, Dr. Prue. Thank you so much for your time. This was very interesting. I also want to thank our participants for their very interesting questions. Um, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to wrap up. Um, just want to thank everybody again for participating in this discussion and for Dr. Prue for, for helping us out um, with this wonderful presentation. So I will send out an email with the recording um, along with a survey that we would love for you to fill out that really helps us to determine what kinds of webinars to do in the future. Um, if you have any questions that we didn't get to, please feel free to email me. Um, I will go ahead and give you my email address. I actually will send it out to everyone um, via the chat so that you have that information. Um, but it's admin at faceforpets.org. And again, I will send it out. Um, and we'll have more upcoming discussions as part of the educational series that we will be hosting. So thank you again, for Dr. Pru, and um, thank you again for everybody for participating. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Oops, I'm gonna send out that email.